Um, hi folks, I'm Alex Ray. I'm on the robotics team here, and this is going to be a different sort of talk. Um, this is an overview of a recent large team result. And instead of being uh, these like really great intern projects, unfortunately, they're, they're limited on people and limited on time. This is about uh, 12 months worth of work for about 12 people. So there's a lot to get through. I'm only going to scratch the surface of it. If you want to learn more, we have a really well-produced three-minute video. It's on YouTube and our website. It's a really cool overview. We have a blog post that's a nice like human readable format as well as like a longer uh, research paper on it. So lots of different levels of detail. But for now, um, I'm going to give you an overview of what we did and sort of like a peek into the inside of it. Um, so quick outline of like how I'm going to break down my tiny amount of time is describe the task, the sort of problem we tried to solve, um, the research process itself, sort of like what solving it looked like, um, the systems we built, which were actually very, very simple, um, and what results we got from them. So our task. We have this uh, five-fingered dexterous robot hand. It's under-actuated. It's got 20 degrees of control and 24 degrees of freedom. For reinforcement learning folks that deal with continuous control, that is an awful lot. Um, and we have objects in the hand that we would like it to be able to manipulate. And for us, manipulate means achieve arbitrary rotations. Um, so if you imagine holding a small object in your hand, can you point it in an arbitrary direction without dropping it? Um, so our primary goal, this was sort of our north star, we want to manipulate this object with a robot hand, and specifically we want a sequence of 50 independently randomly drawn rotations. Um, some secondary goals that we wanted to hit but weren't exactly necessary were we would like to solve it from vision, which means you don't need a specialized object. You can just drop the object in the hand, and like as long as your vision model can see it, you'll be able to manipulate it. Um, we want to uh, manipulate diverse objects, so not just cubes that say the letters of open AI on them. Um, and we want to train using a physics simulator without any real data. Um, and so again, our North Star is the primary task. The rest of it were things that were sort of reach goals. Um, so here, like Fish demonstrated, here's an example of our physical setup. There's this giant cage with a robot hand in it. Um, and on the other side is our simulation, it rendered with our simulation renderer. Um, uh, the robot is a giant bag of unmodeled effects. It has backlash, it has uh, transmission uh, problems, it has creep and stretch in the tendons. Um, and the simulator has none of that. Um, here's our secondary goal of, of the, the cameras. This is just sort of showing where the cameras are in the cage. Um, our secondary goal of diverse objects. This is us manipulating a octahedral prison, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, and then training purely in simulated data. So this is all the stuff we have during training is we both have a renderer that simulates our vision data and a, a physics simulator that simulates our physics data. Uh, and sort of uh, the, the process that we went to do it is a lot of dealing with robot hands. It's not all training models. Um, but it starts with training models. Uh, so we really just over and over for 12 months did this iterative cycle that got faster and faster as we got better at it. Uh, it used to take you know, more than a month, and now we're able to do this in like a few days. Um, we train a totally new model with reinforcement learning um, uh, that controls the policy of the robot and a totally new model for um, vision that is able to localize the object inside the hand. Um, we try running it on the real robot, we observe that it fails, and we observe how it fails, and then try to improve it and repeat. Um, so with all of these systems, like reinforcement learning with robotics, with uh, deep neural networks, um, with physics simulation, all of these are sources of complexity. So in all cases, largely we were trying to focus on building the simplest thing that worked. Um, and the simplest possible solution. Um, so one of the things we did was we started very ambitiously and then eventually had to break it down to a much, much simpler task. Um, we initially started with trying to achieve six degrees of freedom on the object. So not only where is it, uh, uh, not only what direction is it pointed, but where is it like lifted up off the palm and things like that. We simplified that to be uh, just rotation. We simplified that to be just major axis aligned rotation, just like get the x-axis to be uh, up. Um, then we just tried spinning it around z. And then when we had trouble doing that, we just tried 
reaching the fingertips to arbitrary positions in space. Um, eventually, we were able to climb back up this ramp, but um, this was a big part in like unlocking a bunch of research project uh, progress quickly early in the project. Um, another sort of thing we learned along the way is that you have to try lots of things at once. In the blog post and the, the paper, we described two of our vision tracking systems, but we don't really describe all of the ones that we tried that didn't work. Here's just some, I'm, I'm probably missing some, we tried opto, um, OptiTrack, like retroreflective infrared tracking dots. Um, these are common in the motion picture industry. We tried depth cameras, like a real sense or Kinect. We tried magnetic uh, field uh, tracking, like um, Polymus, or like the uh, sort of early virtual reality uh, controller setups. We tried active illumination targets, the face space. Those are those red dots that you see on the fingertips. That actually did work. Um, we tried fiducial and barcode tracking, like Aruko. Um, and, and finally, we tried the vision cameras. Um, and while the paper sort of like is, here's the simplest thing that worked, um, there's quite a lot of things that didn't work ahead of that. Um, uh, and the final research ingredient for like how we were able to solve this task was lots and lots of domain randomizations. Um, we found that like instead of trying to accurately model the robot, simulating the robot with, with all of its basically bag of unmodeled effects would have been effectively impossible and definitely would have run much, much slower than real time. And we want a fast simulator. So we added lots of domain randomizations where instead of accurately modeling the world, you just have to model the noise of the world. And sometimes the noise of the world is more efficient to sample from. Um, so for example, we don't know the exact friction on the hand. We had Actually, we didn't even really know what units of friction were or what same values were. Um, so uh, uh, additionally, there are things on the hand that might approximate themselves as friction, like ridges due to machining or uh, little screw holes that objects could get caught in. Um, so uh, additionally, there's different types of materials. So uh, instead of like trying to accurately model these, we just took all the parts of the hand, which visually you saw sort of like being different colors, and we assigned them all very different frictions. Um, uh, during this time, some, somewhere along the project, we actually started, uh, we contracted a professional roboticist to come in and fix the hand whenever it broke because we were breaking it so often. Um, and when we told them what values of friction we were using, they were uh, surprised it worked at all. Um, but again, uh, these, these, these simple systems are able to learn very robust policies. Um, we also tried adding a glove to the robot, trying to solve it the other side. So instead of solving it with the AI, solve it with the physical world, and it turns out gloves didn't end up working, which is sort of surprising to us. Um, but the domain randomization did. So here's the quick overview of the system we built. Um, uh, a bigger graphic sort of from, from the one you saw from Fish earlier. Um, we have, on the top left, we have our policy, which is a very, very simple um, recurrent model. And then um, in the middle, we have our vision model. Uh, we train both of them separately. They're not actually trained together. We tried that once, and it turned out to not help. So it's computationally cheaper to train them both. Uh, we did that. Um, and then when they're rolled out on the real world, we just sort of like slap them both together. We take camera images from the camera. We pass them to the vision model. It generates observations for the uh, position of the object. We add that to the sort of observations of the robot, give it to the policy, act, and repeat. Um, for the neural network nerds out there, here is a rough diagram of the vision model. It's very simple. We like, we're sort of surprised this worked. Um, uh, sort of like Fish described, three convolutional towers that, that all share our parameters. You slap them together, and then you guess the position from ro and rotation off them. And Fish's work did a, a bunch to like improve this result. Um, it turns out that we were able to just use this and get it to work on the real robot. Um, uh, the policy architecture is also very simple, like normal actor critic setup. Um, we have noise observations and a, a goal that are given to the actor. The actor is the interesting one, the one on the left, um, because that's the one that actually runs on the real robot. Um, it's a fully connected layer and LSTM and the output actions. Uh, that's all it took to achieve something that the field of robotics hadn't been able to achieve before. Um, uh, and then the value network has more observation that's not noise, so it has basically more things going on. But mostly it's used to um, uh, calculate advantages during training. So it's not actually used on the real robot, and we don't care that it doesn't have to model the domain randomization noise as much. Um, so this tr uh, the training architecture is like an interesting part of the paper. Most of what's involved in this is this is how you get to training a um, 
simulated robotics policy on more than 6,000 CPUs and 8 GPUs. Um, most of this is in support of just being able to do that training. This turned out to be the simplest thing that worked. Uh, and not only was it the simplest thing that worked for us, we actually sort of inherited it from a different team at OpenAI. Um, a system we call it, uh, Rapid, and it's the same system that powers the Dota bot. Um, so they have a lot of things in common. In, in our paper, we compare both software actor critic and PPO, but the PPO is basically the same PPO that's um, playing very, very well against really good players at Dota 2. Um, uh, and then for our, our robotic-specific system, we have our robotic-specific things. And for the Dota-specific system, they have their Dota-specific things. Um, sort of, all right, results. What we found out. Um, I guess the most important result is that, yes, we are able to do this task. We are able to do simple object manipulation. We can learn a policy from and a vision model purely from simulated data, which transfers to the real robot hand. Um, and then sort of our sub-results were the things we talked about as side goals earlier. Um, we're able to act from sparse observations. So the actor, again, the, the policy network, the thing on the left is the one that runs on the real robot. That little X with note four is interesting. It's it listed in the paper. We meant to include this. We didn't as a software bug, and it still worked. Um, so that was kind of surprising. Um, it turns out that the we, we talk about some of the surprising findings in the blog post. There's a lot of things that like are counterintuitive to what traditional roboticists would think that uh, we are able to, to figure out. I'm going to go through the rest of these real quick. Um, we are able to track objects from ca uh, cameras. We have very low um, uh, positional and rotational error, lower than real images. Part of it is that gathering real data is really, really, really hard and unstable. If you like bump something in the setup or you change the how a curtain is hanging, your real data gets old fast. But Simulator keeps on going. Um, we're able to manipulate different objects. We're able to manipulate this octagonal prism. Um, we tried a couple other objects that uh, round, large round objects, it has trouble manipulating. We're still trying to understand that. Um, we're able to train in a simple simulator, even with all of our randomizations, it still trains. Um, uh, we're able to show that the randomizations that we added improved performance in the real world. I'm just going to skip to this because I'm out of time. Um, uh, having an LSTM is better than having a ComNet, is better than just being fully connected. Um, uh, running with more GPUs gives you better performance. Um, yep, yeah. and questions? We have time for one, maybe two questions. Oh man, there's lots and lot. Yeah, uh, they're all enumerated in the paper. The short answer is as many things as we could. For the vision model, we actually used Unity, which is a video game renderer, instead of the default renderer, because video game renderers give you lots. Like, in, in pursuit of being more photorealistic, they give you many more dials. They, you can adjust the metallicness or glossiness or like the, the, ref, the color of the reflectance. Uh, we randomized everything we could. Um, on the physics side, we randomized as much as we, we, that was a more manual process. It turns out physics simulators mostly want to be accurate. They don't want to be inaccurate. Um, uh, and a bunch of the effects were expensive to model. So we tried to simulate backlash. And we, we explained a little of this in the paper. We don't get it exactly right. Modeling backlash is a really, really hard problem. But we can sort of randomly move motors in the opposite direction. And that's close enough sometimes. Um, and so the phase space dots, the dots on the fingertips, if you curl them all the way in, they can't be seen by the vision system and they go away. And it's hard to model exactly which states those dots disappear in. But we can just have them disappear for 25% of the time and it roughly approximates it. So um, yeah, uh, many of it is, is the things that we can figure out and that are easy to randomize, we just randomize by default. Um, and for things that we think would help and that we notice on the robot and have hypotheses about, we'll manually add every single one. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, does the improvement level out uh, with the number of um, domains randomization um, Some So some randomizations help. Some randomizations hurt. Um, some randomizations uh, sort of break even. In basically every case, we're able to solve the task in simulation. This is something that's sort of different than like normal academic 
reinforcement learning and like Majoko or simulated physics worlds is they care that they can solve it in simulation. Basically, everything we did, we were able to solve in simulation. The only thing that counted is if it worked on the real robot. Um, and we're very, very limited by how many runs we can. Um, for every trial, we would have to run our baseline policy, so a policy with known performance, um, just to make sure the robot wasn't broken and was behaving the correct way for a bunch of times. And then we'd have to run our experimental policy a bunch of times. So there's a bunch of domain randomizations. We're not sure if they improved because we added them all at once and they helped, so we kept them all. 